Welcome to Plant Power. This is episode three. According to the USDA Economic Research Service, organic products grow in demand significantly every day, with organic sales making up more than 4% of total American food sales. But what does organic really mean? Today, we're exploring that question with seasoned organic farm manager, Christine Mason, who has been farming for more than 30 years. Plus, keep listening after the interview for some quick clinical insights from practitioner Dave Hogshead. Hi, today we're here with Christine Mason, organic farming expert who's taken time out of harvesting to be with myself, Sarah, and Kara and Megan to have a discussion about organic farming. Hi, Christine, how are you? I'm great, Sarah, hi. Good to hear from you. I want to dive right in. And um, if you could tell us what is organic, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there on what's the difference like between organic and non-GMO and all this, and how do they differ? So could you just kind of define what organic means? Yeah, start out with one of my favorite topics. I love it. So I think it's really important to understand the definition of organic It's a very specific definition. It is a legal term. So when you tell people you are certified organic, organic, um, there are legal parameters and guidelines that you have to fall within to be certified organic. I think it's also very important to know that a lot of terms that are used a lot in this country, such as natural or regenerative, have no legal parameters or definition. And so a person that says they're regenerative may or may not be organic. A person that says they have all natural food may or may not be organic. But if you um, get produce that says certified organic, it is an absolute guarantee that the food was raised without genetic modification. There's no GMOs allowed in any form in an organic system. It means that it was raised without any synthetic inputs. So it's a promise of practice that we are farming without synthetic herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, and nothing synthetic also means no synthetic fertilization. So a lot of the country fertilizes their crops with a petroleum nitrogen, such as urea, 28%, 32%, and hydrous ammonia, something like that. So when you're certified organic, it's also a promise that even our fertility inputs have to be from an approved source and nothing synthetic. Can you define what synthetic means? Because I think people don't always understand that term. Well, in organic, non-synthetic means it has to be derived, uh, I just talked about natural, but from a natural source. And so we are allowed to use, say, an insecticide, but it might be from a clove oil, or it might be peppermint. It might be from a chrysanthemum. So everything we use is from a natural source. We can use, for instance, potassium sulfate if it's a mined natural source of potassium and it's not slagged with any chemicals. So a lot of fertility is also treated in the United States. We're not allowed to do that. A lot of seed in the United States, for example, if you look at most of the corn or soybeans that are planted in the United States, they're purple or green or blue because they're treated with a lot of chemically made fungicides, insecticides. We can't do that either. So there's absolutely nothing that is not from a natural source allowed in an organic system. And you have to have a source that has been approved by your organic certifier or on the national OMRI list. So it's not just Christine saying, oh, don't worry, it's a natural source. Mm -hmm. It has to come from an approved source and the audit trail is intense and I think it's a good thing that it is intense because saying you're organic isn't just words. Uh, You have to have the paperwork and the inputs to prove it. So organic, when you tell someone you are certified organic, it's a promise of practice of the way you're farming. Yeah. I do think that non-GMO label is nice and it's a step forward and an important step in this country, but I also want people to understand the non-GMO label is not a promise of organic. 
So a non-GMO person may have sprayed a bunch of, you know, synthetic pesticides or use synthetic fertilizer. But really the promise of certified organic is a step above and beyond that because it's promising no GMO and no synthetics. Yeah. You know, that really helps to clarify because there's so much confusion, I think, out in the general marketplace of how those are different and what those mean. So I really appreciate that clarification. So how do you think organic farming really makes a difference to the soil and to then the people who consume it? I'm super excited that the organic is the fastest growing trend in what people are buying for their families as far as food is concerned. I found it on the USDA ERS website right now. It says organic products have shifted from being a lifestyle choice for a small share of consumers to being consumed at least occasionally by the majority of Americans. So the USDA is saying two thirds of surveyed shoppers are buying organic. I think that's awesome. So that means I tell people shop and make difference to America with your dollars. So the more people that are buying organic, the more farmers that are gonna have to look into growing that way. I think it's an important trend for the soil in our country. There are a lot of things tied to organic farming. We have an inspection, you know, a conventional farmer is not inspected. Part of our inspection is how we're taking care of our soil, how we're, what we're doing to build the soil our sustainability efforts. And I don't think it's bad that um, we have to every year review exactly what we're doing and if we could do better. So I like that part of being organic. I'm not saying no conventional farmer is sustainable, isn't sustainable or responsible, but it's tied into part of our yearly inspection. And I like that. Now I gotta say too, um, probably surprise America, two thirds of Americans are buying something organic, but only 5% of the acres in this country are farmed organically right now. So it's a shockingly small number that's growing. It's a tough way to farm. It's a, it's a big time commitment. You know, it's interesting because, you know, if you think about how a lot of farming has happened and obviously a lot of farming isn't also only for food consumption, right? I mean, we're farming corn as huge for industrial uses. But I think the idea of glyphosate has really become something that people are thinking about. I had read a study last year that had come out where they looked at people and their exposure to glyphosate from 50 years ago and now, and it's, you know, significantly increased. We see glyphosate exposure in umbilical cord blood. And so I think the reduction of those chemicals has a positive impact as a whole in our health and our society. And so the promise of organic is really important, right? You know, to not have those exposures. Yeah, um, the, the growth of glyphosate can be directly tied to the growth of genetic modification in our country. And so that's why most of these crops were genetically modified, right? So you could spray glyphosate and no other herbicide if you so chose. Mm-hmm. I'm not, that's not necessarily the responsible way to use it, but it's the way that it happened. And so the growth of glyphosate is just exponentially high every year since these GMOs were introduced. And that is one problem I have with regenerative farming is regenerative farming does not have a legal definition. So we just talked that organic does. Mm -hmm. And you might have as many definitions of regenerative as there are farmers you talk to. But one branch of regenerative says absolutely no tillage ever. Well, there's really one big way people avoid tillage. And that is these no-till farmers are using more and more glyphosate. They tend to um, use more glyphosate than other forms and methods of farming. So there's ups and downsides of every decision made. But certainly I think it's every farmer's responsibility to be regenerative and responsible. To me, regenerative means leave the soil better than you found it and try to feed future generations. But I'm proud that we've been able to figure out how to do it without glyphosate. I've heard you talk about this before and in this idea of no till, but you guys are tilling and Mm -hmm. that becomes a big part of actually how you improve your soil health. Can you talk a little bit about that 
and maybe yeah. talk about how you use that in crop rotation. You bet. I think uh, soil science is one of the oldest science there sciences there is, and um, we know a lot, but we are also on the forefront of learning even more, and it's exciting. You know, I tell people, if you read Little House on the Prairie, like everybody had to in grade school, or I had to, they kept moving west, right? We didn't know better. So we'd farm wheat, 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 until the ground was worn out, and we'd move on. And tillage um, was responsible for the Dust Bowl, tillage and the weather. You know, we didn't know better and we're learning a lot so you have to be responsible with your tillage and you can't take a single tillage pass lightly but for the most part if we till the soil we do it when we're tilling something in and we grow these beautiful cover crops and green manures and the way you can terminate a green manure or a cover crop which we could talk about too is with tillage or glyphosate. Those are the two main ways you could terminate a crop. And so we choose tillage. And I think that when you till in these beautiful crops that were grown only to feed the soil. So a green manure or cover crop is grown only to give back to the soil. And when you turn something in that lush and that green and that beautiful, you're not even exposing bare dirt. When we do that, we leave a lot of residue on the surface. But what we're doing is we're feeding the microorganisms down in the soil. And um, I know that the way we're doing tillage has been responsible because opposite of the trend in most of the world, our organic matter on every single field we monitor has grown. And organic matter can't grow if you're doing irresponsible tillage. So we don't till for no reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Having grown up as a farm girl in South Dakota, and so I remember my grandparents having these discussions about the Dust Bowl and how they would put wet towels under the door because, you know, the topsoil was just blowing away because they didn't have this knowledge, right? And they took what they thought crop rotation was, was corns and beans and maybe wheat, you know, and perhaps maybe, I remember my dad growing sorghum too. But so if we think about, you know, this crop rotation, and you talked about that, and, you know, leaving idle crops to become part of what is making your soil stronger, you know, what else does that do? What? It, why is that diversity so important in how we grow, you know, our crops? Every year, we have about 30 different crops in rotation. So like you said, most people in America, if you say, I rotate my crops, they mean I went from corn to soybeans, which are like monocropped, right, row crops. And we have this beautiful diversity and think of the huge difference there is between a radish and red clover flower or between a drilled buckwheat and, you know, a turnip. It's just, there's just this beautiful diversity. And the number one reason we could get away with no insecticide and no fungicide is because of this diversity. So insects and fungal diseases have very specific tastes and they attack very specific hosts. And when you have all this rotation, it's one of the key reasons we've had so much success without synthetic insecticide and no fungicide on the farm. Um, this is the 20th season. I've managed this farm and knock on wood, we've never lost a single crop to a crop disease ever. And that is just mind blowing. And we don't use any fungicide synthetic or natural, nothing other than this diversity and healthy soil. I think you need to come and help me because I have tomato fungus and I cannot get rid of it, but I move. So I'll have to start over and get rid of the tomato, tomato fungus. Tomato lights for everybody. <laughs> tomato you know, fungus. in a yard, I have trouble at home too. My garden's only so big, right? It's not, right. It's not 600 acres big, it's my garden plot. And so even if you move your tomatoes at home, you know, moving them 10 feet probably isn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> to keep disease out, yeah. <laughs> We're lucky that the farm is as big as it is too. Like uh, certain things like clubfoot in Nebraska or certain diseases that are really bad. We have the beauty in the 20 years I've been there, some crops aren't on the same acre ever. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we're lucky. Right. Yeah, we're yeah. lucky. You know, okay, so we talked about using crops 
um, that grow to become part of, you know, the manure, green manure. What is the other, I mean, you also have a really strong um, composting process. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know I'm an avid composter and um, I think, you know, composting is really an important aspect um, to what is happening on the farm and and to what a lot of people do to like make sure that their, you know, gardens are growing well. Sure. Every crop needs an input, right? So it makes sense that if you're going to take all this beautiful kale or a huge Brussels sprout off of a field, you took the nutrition that it needed to grow off the field as well. So you can't keep taking without giving back. It's not sustainable. It's not the way you feed the world. And so every crop on the planet needs the nutrition and the health and the vitality of the soil uh, or it can't grow. So the way that we fertilize and keep our soil healthy is our number one input is these green manures. And so what that means is we're going to grow a crop with a lot of diversity. So we might throw in a clover and a vetch and sorghum or some type of fibrous plant. And we let it get between our knee and our hip and we work it in. That's green manure because you have to have a fertility source that's natural. And that means basically plant-based or animal-based for the most part, right? Um, so we do grow a lot of green manure. We do use on a limited basis, some composted chicken manure. We use a lot of our beautiful compost and we create all of our own compost. We have it on a two acre site. We make a lot of compost and everything that is pressed at our farm, we are left with just the fiber or lignin of the plant after we make extraction or juice. And so our compost is 100% certified organic vegetative crops from our own farm. And it's the most beautiful, gorgeous compost you've ever seen. And we spread it about once a year and we've spread it thin across all the fields and it's beautiful, helps a lot. So compost is totally broken down already, right? So you work in this beautiful green manure that's a living crop. You can imagine compost, we've done some of the work of breaking it down before it's applied. And so if you can put on green manure that's in its very primal stage of breaking down and compost, you have all these different stages of feed for the microorganisms and every microorganism likes a different food. And so the more diversity and the more dense you can make your soil a living system, the better. And I tell people, Every crop looks different above the ground. Every crop looks different below the ground too. And so the exudates or the things that a root exudes below the ground feed totally different. You know, everybody has different taste and so do microorganisms. And the more diversity you can have above and below the ground, the better. And compost helps us do that. So the diversity of the microbes is really, you know, unique and important. And I, I think it's somewhat an art and a science, but can you talk a little bit about the science aspect of what you guys are doing to make sure that you're putting the right diversity? Um, yeah. I know there's a large project going on that really is looking at diversity of the microbes. Yeah. It's going to be fun, isn't it? Kind yeah. of cutting edge. I know. I love it. It's like soil science and Star Trek. I love it. <laughs> uh, I love some of the stereotypes of farmers and, um, you know, anybody, I'm so glad that we're talking about the farm and this farm is so unique and awesome. We use GPS to soil test. And so we have these beautiful soil tests that tell us really accurately um, within a very small area exactly what our macro and micronutrition is, our pH, our organic matter, our cation exchange capacities. We have a drone now for the first time um, that we could fly over crops, Sarah, and tell exactly like the bricks levels are better in this area. This area of the field looks like it has having some stress. And so all those tools help us really fine tune where to put what input and maybe which cover crops would do better where. And I just love the science of these decisions. The newest science 
is looking, like you said, at the diversity of living organisms within the soil. And I think that it, it's a new project for us. We just started, but I think it's just going to be one more way to prove that organic can feed the world. It is a sustainable system and um, that the practices we're doing are impacting soil health. You know, I think you made an interesting comment that people have like this thoughts about how farmers are. And I got to spend time on the farm and we went through really in-depth science on genetics of the seeds that we're looking at. And I've got to be a little bit involved with the microbiome work. And it's high science. And so I really think organic farming, it's both art and science. It's, you know, a combination and and a lot of love, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I love most, Sarah? I have farmed conventionally and now 20 years I've farmed organically. So I've done it both ways. But the thing I personally love the most about my life and on this farm is you have to be in touch with the soil. And I think that's the reason most people major in agriculture. I think that's the reason most people want to go back to the farm is because they really love the soil itself. And organic farming, you better have your feet on the ground. You better walk all your fields and you better be in touch because there is no rescue. That's what I tell people. To me, one of the biggest differences in conventional agriculture, oh, we didn't rotate the right way, but we can use an insecticide if we get corn borer. Oh, you know, we might not have rotated the right way for fertility, but we can put on some more urea. Mm -hmm. um, we just, there are no rescues in organics. So you have to be continually forward thinking. You have to know every decision you make this year affects the next, you know, 10. And I love having my feet on the ground and my, my boots in the dirt. And that's one of the most rewarding parts of it to me. Yeah. You know, one of the other things that I think is that you have a record of improving your carbon, right, over the last, you guys have been keeping records for the last, what, 18, 20 years, and shown that you've been able to improve the soil versus, you know, some crops, and we know that that isn't the case. And so yeah. really, you know, that organic can be a way of increasing crop yield. And then also we know that, I mean, we focus a lot on the phytonutrients aspects too. Yeah. You know, carbon sequestration is kind of a new buzz and I think it's important. And so um, we have had some carbon sequestration um, results and measures of our soil, but that is much newer than mm -hmm. um, studying this uh, organic matter itself. And they say healthy soil supports three pounds of living organisms for every square yard of soil. And when you increase your organic matter, you have the best chance of feeding the world. So an increase of organic matter lets more rain filter in when we have a rain event. It holds more moisture when we have a drought. A higher organic matter soil, we've increased the organic matter of the soil we've had control of for over 20 years by 30 to 130 percent it's just mind-blowing wow so we've increased the nutrient holding capacity of our soil by 20 percent just by increasing the organic matter it, it's just amazing and i measured um i did the math but just the front four fields of our farm we have an additional four million almost just shut short of four million gallons of water holding capacity just by increasing the organic matter and so we are proud that I think we're going to leave the soil we've been responsible for in better shape than the way we found it. Yeah. You know, I think that's also important, like the water capacity, right? Because mm -hmm. then you're not having to add as much. And we know that's such a precious resource. I mean, we're lucky because we live in Wisconsin and we have more fresh water than other places. But like as a whole, that really can be something that's super important for the value of organic, yeah. right? It's going to be more and more and more important. Um, you know, interesting, you know, whether you believe one way or the other why we have global warming, it is getting warmer and warmer and it's getting harder and harder to farm. And so water holding capacity is going to be very important for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You probably get this question a lot, but 
what is your response when people say organic produce is too expensive? Uh, you know, I was very fortunate and I got to be on the organic advisory council for the state of Wisconsin for three terms. And so I learned so much, you know, just being able to sit on this board with a lot of wonderful, diverse producers, but I have several answers. Number one is perhaps the way organic produce is priced is where produce honestly needs to be priced so that farmers can make a sustainable living. Organic farmers don't tend to be as subsidized. We tend to be a little bit more independent and there is no broccoli subsidy. There is no spinach or lettuce or okra subsidy. There's a corn and soybean subsidy in this country, basically we, you know, so I think that we tend to be a little more independent that way. I think that because we're a little bit more independent of subsidy, you know, the price has to be a little higher, I think. Mm -hmm. Really, truly, if you go, let's go, go to the cheapest food you can buy. Let's go to Sam's Club. You could buy a huge tub of organic spinach for $5. You could buy a giant bag of organic carrots, pretty dang cheap. There really is not a huge difference anymore in some prices. Now, organic, to be organic, cannot have preservatives either, right? Uh, a synthetic preservative. So if you buy an organic product way out of season, like if you buy organic strawberries in season, there's not much difference. If you want to have an organic strawberry shipped to you from who knows where in the middle of the winter, probably is pricier because it's just tougher to be mm -hmm. organic sometimes that way. Mm -hmm. But the true difference in organic prices are mostly in meat, in my opinion. And the organic label carries with it a promise of humane treatment of an animal. So a lot of people, I think we've undermarketed that. If you market organic meat, you are making a promise that the animal that was slaughtered was allowed to have its natural lifestyle, its whole life. And so organic poultry has to have a roost, has to have a nesting box. Mm -hmm. They have to be allowed access to the outdoors. An organic ruminant has to get a large deal of its nutrition from grazing and being outside. That takes more space than a feedlot. You know, that takes more space than some of these confined CAFOs. And so you, you can't make, you can't produce meat as cheaply if an animal's allowed to have its space. So I tell everybody, have a little piece of organic meat and a great big salad and life is good. I'm glad too that we talked about things like defining organic and defining what is GMO or non-GMO, natural, synthetic, manure, composting, because I think these are all terms that people are vaguely familiar with, but you're talking about non-GMO and organic is not the same. Correct. And... I just think that people kind of have these like kind of this cloud of terminology in their head when they're at their grocery store. And so I think that if someone kind of learns the small nuances between these terms, I think that'll help guide their, their choices I think too. Some things have may intentionally been made confusing. <laughs> Interestingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Christine, thank you so much for this beautiful conversation about organic farming and all of its inputs and outputs it really does make a difference in the world and you know i love your passion so i appreciate it thanks so much for being here thanks for visiting the farm Hi everyone, Dave Hogsett again, and it's just such an incredible privilege for me to follow, or at least to try and follow, the famous Christine Mason. And the reason this is such an honor for me is because Christine is responsible for growing the organic foods that go into the supplements I recommend for my patients. So her work has had a huge impact on my practice and in the health of my patients. And you know, in our clinical nutrition profession, there's so much talk about what foods you should be eating, what foods you should be recommending to your patients but there's so little emphasis given on the soil quality 
that those foods are grown in. And Royal Lee said many years ago that whole food nutrition starts with the soil. Everything depends on the soil. And even if our patients are technically eating the right foods, it's likely some of those foods were grown in less than optimal soil. And that soil has developed mineral deficiencies like magnesium and many other nutritional shortcomings. So I always love hearing the passion that Christine has for organic farming. And to do the grand scale organic farming that she does, you have to have passion for it. Because as you heard, it's not easy, not even close to being easy. She mentioned that only 5% of the farm makers in this country are farmed organically, 5%, even though the demand for organic food is higher than ever before. And that really tells you how difficult organic farming is. So hats off to people like Christine for making that commitment to organic regenerative farming. And her work is really helping to dispel the myth that you have to use GMO or you have to apply chemicals to prevent crop loss to disease. I was amazed to hear that in the 20 years she's been doing this, she's never lost a single crop to disease. That's amazing. And the fact that the organic matter is increasing on the field she's managing from 30% increase to 130% increase in organic matter, that's proof positive that organic farming can work. The trend in most of this country is that farm soil becomes more and more depleted over time. But she's doing the opposite, increasing the soil quality, increasing the nutrient content and microorganism diversity in that soil. And with the scientific advancements she now has at her disposal, it's only going to get better and better. But to realize just how special her work is, you have to step back and look at really the state of conventional farming in this country now. In the last podcast, we talked about some of the sobering statistics for genetically modified organism use in the U.S., but let's talk for a minute about some of the current stats for pesticide use today. Just let this number sink in. There are over 1 billion pounds of pesticides used in America every year. A billion pounds. And a lot of these pesticides are systemic, meaning you can't wash them off. They go throughout the whole fruit and vegetable. And a lot of these pesticides are persistent. That means they last in the soil for many, many years. The FDA released a report in 2019 revealing that 84% of fruit in the U.S. contained pesticide residue, and 53% of vegetables contained pesticide residue. And in total, they found 221 different pesticides in our produce. But one of the pesticides they found was DDT, which was banned in 1972. So a pesticide that's been banned for almost 50 years is still showing up in our soil, and even more importantly, it's still showing up in our food. So this is another reason certified organic farming is so important. 80% of apples in the U.S. are sprayed with a pesticide that's been banned in the European Union because of its health concerns. So again, it's great that people are trying to eat more fruits and vegetables, the right foods, but there's some big unwanted baggage with today's produce. And even though most people know the basic difference between conventionally grown crops and organic, they may not really understand that these chemicals used to treat our food really do end up in our bodies. So a group of Harvard scientists reported in 2018 in an issue of JAMA that 90% of Americans have detectable levels of pesticides in their blood and urine. And we just don't know what the long-term health effects are of all of these small cumulative doses exposures of pesticides that we're all carrying around in our bodies now. Sarah mentioned that the very widely used pesticide glyphosate is now showing up in umbilical cord blood. And glyphosate is everywhere in our food supply, especially in GMO foods. We mentioned that in the last podcast, but also in grains like non-organic wheat and oats. And in 2015, the International Agency for Research on Cancer said that glyphosate is a very probable carcinogen. And we talked in the last podcast about how glyphosate exposure it's also very likely to disrupt our microbiome. It's recently estimated that up to 50% of the organisms in our microbiome can be negatively impacted with this very common pesticide. So another good resource on the ewg.org website is a list of specific name brand foods that glyphosate is commonly found in. And they recently released a report on the high levels of glyphosate found in specific popular name brand hummus. 
So we discussed in the last podcast also that these are just some of the reasons that supporting detoxification is more important than ever before. And the thought hit me as I was listening to Christine talk about the organic farm that what she's doing specifically is not only optimizing the nutrient content of the soil that these foods are grown in, but she's also growing some of the most important vegetables to support detox pathways in our bodies when we do get exposed to these pesticides, especially the cruciferous vegetables like Brussels sprouts and Spanish black radish. And seriously, who else do you know that's growing Spanish black radish on their farm? So thank you for that specifically, Christine. So guys, remember in today's world, it's not enough to eat the right foods. You also have to make sure that the right foods are grown in the right soil that's been treated the right way. I learned so much in today's podcast about the amount of hard work it takes to grow the superfoods and the supplements I give my patients. And my friend Sarah said it best in this podcast when she said this successful organic farming work is a combination of science, art, and a lot of love. It takes a lot of love and dedication to do this right. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you, Christine and Dave, for sharing your expertise as guests on this episode. To learn more, visit holisticmatters.com. That's holistic with a W.